It's come a long way in a short space of time, but the concept of a circular economy is still unfamiliar to many. So what is it about the circular economy that's caught the attention of one of the most influential and valuable brands on the planet? Well, today I'm speaking with Google's Jim Miller to find out. Welcome to the Disruptive Innovation Festival, the online festival that asks the question, the economy is changing, what do I need to know, experience and do? If the circular economy is a new term to you, then you're not alone. In a nutshell, we're talking about moving from the linear, take, make, dispose way of doing things to a system that is restorative and regenerative by design. To help me get into some more of the detail, and to find out what this new economic model could mean for Google, I'm joined by Jim Miller, Vice President of Operations for Google. Jim's made a timely exit from the US to be with us here at the DIFF headquarters today. Thanks for being with us, Jim. Thank you, it's great to be here. And I'm also joined by Nick Engineer, the Global Partners Lead for the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Hi, Nick. Hi. Thanks for being here. It's a pleasure. And Google are one of our, our global partners, so that explains your presence in the studio with us today. Almost entirely. <laughs> So before we get going, it's absolutely vital that we hear some of your voice in the conversation today. We could have a lovely chat by ourselves, I'm sure, but I'm sure you've got some fantastic questions to put to Jim and to Nick today. So there's two main ways that you can do that. You can comment below the video that you're watching me on now, use the discussion forum using your MyDiff account to ask your questions, or if you're on Twitter, you can use hashtag thinkdiff we'll be looking out for questions using that hashtag and I'll have them sent through to me throughout the session. But first, Jim, can you bring us up to speed a bit? How did Google get from, uh, I imagine, not knowing too much about the circular economy to becoming a global partner of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation? Yeah, it's, a, it's quite an interesting journey. Um, Google is a company who built itself around principles of now what we call the circular economy. We just didn't really know that, that there was such a thing called the circular economy. So we are a company who I believe at its roots and its foundation thinks in systems where you know, things are regenerative and the way we run our data centers, the way we design the very infrastructure that powers Google is built around economic principles which we now recognize in retrospect are foundational to the circular economy. So the story how we got involved was uh, we belong to a group called the Corporate Eco Forum, and I run sustainability as, as part of my role. And a number of years ago, uh, the leader uh, of that group, M. R. Rangoswamy, and I were talking about how we wanted to look, and we were we were looking at economic systems of running our data centers as closed loop entities, where the ultimate and end all be all goal is to have zero waste and use everything to its ultimate uh, extreme. And you know, he, uh, MR said, you, know, you really should talk to this group, uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, because they're proposing and espousing this notion of the circular economy. And it was amazing, it was almost serendipitous, because as we learned about what Ellen MacArthur and, and the foundation uh, their goal around circular economy, it dovetailed perfectly into what we were trying to do. And, you know, the, we, we've been a global partner going on for two years now, and it is incredibly well aligned to how Google thinks and the ultimate goal of running this, you know, continuous virtual cycle uh, of, of our resources and the way we think about our, our infrastructure. So the, the, it was a uh, just a very, very uh, opportune time to, to get engaged with the, the foundation. So there were, there were activities that were already in place that, in, in hindsight, you, you now would say are uh, aligned with the circular economy, but also, I'm, I'm getting, there's a way of thinking as well Absolutely. that was already built in at Google. Absolutely. Now, I think we're still very, you know, uh, immature and, and, you know, new to many concepts. We want to do things well beyond how we're doing them today. 
but yeah, exactly. We're we're well aligned to what in, it, again in retrospect we look at and go, ah, that's circular thinking. And has that has that been uh, a helpful sort of way to to package it up? I mean, if these things are already in process, I, you might think, well, what does the circular economy add? But does it is it a way to to focus those efforts or to a way to to refine that thinking? It's a great question. I, I think it's actually uh, both. So it allowed us to take these activities and build a framework around them, both a framework of thinking, of teaching, a framework of analysis around economics, material science, uh, but ultimately it allows us to actually frame much of what we're doing today and in the future around the concepts of, of circularity. And when you think about the activities that, that Google kind of have in, and, and Alphabet I guess as well, um, in, over at uh, Mountain View and, and around the world, there's a lot going on. Uh, there's self-driving cars, there's energy projects, there's obviously data centers, AI. Sure. Does this, how, how do you pick where to start with, with something like the circular economy? Well, for us, it's fairly simple. Uh, at its core, as you mentioned, we have a lot of activities that are happening around the company. It's no secret, the biggest bang for the buck, so to speak, is around our global data centers that power a big chunk of the internet and search and YouTube and, and other uh, applications of Google. That's where billions of dollars of capital are being uh, expended every year to build and operate data centers. And it's obviously a very material intensive. I know most people don't think about the internet, but the internet is in fact a, a material intensive environment. So that was the logical first step because it allowed us the largest leverage, bang for the buck, so to speak, of circular concept. And then as we start to think about our other operations around the company, it's a natural springboard uh, into those efforts. But really the data centers was the, the impetus and the, uh, the catalyst for um, the, the circular economy. And can you tell us a bit more about um, this circular economy approach to the data centers? Because I know there's there's a, a, a quite a substantial case study that's been published on the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's website. So what else can you tell us about how uh, a circular economy data center, for want of a better sure. term, looks? Well, at its core, if you think about a, a data center, it's, it's, it's a large building. And in many cases, it's, it's a series of buildings. Um, so we, under the umbrella of data infrastructure, we've got a large construction company. We've got, uh, we're running cloud infrastructure, compute, networking, storage, uh, and we're running a large facilities operation to, to power the data centers and, and run them tw seven by 24. So it's an amalgam of a number of different operations and supply chains. But at its core, and it's well aligned, and I think this, this is absolutely a critical point to the circular economy, we want to run our data centers as efficiently as possible for economics purposes, for other purposes as well. Um, so essentially what the circular concept within the data centers allows us to do is run those operations and align our incentive systems around eking out the most efficiency for an entire life. And that could be the life of a building, which is decades, to the life of a server, which is over a number of years, and everything in between for various infrastructure. Now I won't go into a lot of the detail for the sake of time around our case study, but essentially what our case study is at its, at its essence is deploying large-scale infrastructure. We're one of the world's largest server manufacturers, for example. We build large-scale infrastructure uh, to power all of our applications. We deploy that infrastructure and typically it resides in our data centers anywhere from five to seven years. But through all of that lifetime, it will change and morph considerably as we bring in new components and upgrade components. And ultimately, you know, when we exhaust the useful life of that, then we essentially recycle all that material and it goes back into building uh, new server infrastructure. So essentially we're, we're exploiting every piece of efficiency that we can out of that data center for its entire life. And then when its useful life is exhausted, we're actually ensuring that it doesn't get back into a landfill, but it's being recycled in a responsible way. So ultimately it extends the life of that data center and we get the most use or utilization out of that data center for its usable life. And I think some people might, um, it, it, 
every, every large company now, be it from tech or food or, or clothing, needs to have a, uh, a, a kind of a responsibility agenda. But you mentioned about the kind of economic benefits as yeah. well. Is there anything more you can say about that? Yeah, I mean, we look at climate change and our focus on sustainability as there's certainly a philanthropic element to it. But for anything in the sustainability umbrella to be effective and lasting, it has to have sound economic principles behind it and an incentive that is ever you know, generating. We're, we're a business. There's no secret, right? I mean, if, if you're running a company today, you know, apart from products and services and philanthropic efforts, you still have to make money. Mm. You know, we have shareholders. So the thing that we love about the circular economy is it, it's that nexus of doing good, feeling good about what we're doing, but also fully supporting the, the what we, you know, the driving the, the core objectives of the business and making money for the company. So again, it's all aligned, and we think that, and again, the reason that we've become a global partner with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is we think that that's in perfect alignment with how we have to drive, ultimately, as a planet, sustainability. We can't do it as a just a purely philanthropic effort. We have to do it in a way that is aligned to economic incentives of how global economies work today. Mm -hmm. So again, we get the best of both worlds. We're doing things that we think are great and responsible for the planet, and in a way that will be self-generating, we're aligning it with the incentives of the company. And uh, we've spoken a bit about systems, and it's kind of uh, something you led with at the start of the conversation. Artificial intelligence is something that, that people are getting quite excited about, the, mm -hmm. the, the ability for AI to help us understand complex systems. Yeah. Obviously, Google with DeepMind is a, is a real leader in AI. Is there, is there overlap there as well that you could share? Yeah, there is. Um, so we look at a number of classes of, of artificial intelligence. There's machine learning, and, and I won't go into the nuances of, of all of those, but with complex systems, one of the challenges that you've got is writing closed-loop analytical frameworks. Uh, in many cases, the, the data centers are so, so complicated that we can't write a you know, small set of equations that actually define how the data center runs most efficiently. We don't know what, do, what knobs and dials to turn. So effectively what we've done with DeepMinds and our machine learning capability is, we've essentially said, look, there's this ML for a machine learning framework, Let, look at the data centers, understand how the data centers work, and essentially tell us of all of the variables and how they interact with one another, tell us how to run the world's most efficient data center. Now, Interestingly enough, prior to employing ML in our data centers, we believe that we were already running the world's most efficient data centers. And we've been able to eke out an additional 40 to 50% efficiency of running that building by using ML. Mm -hmm. So we've actually been able to extend what any human or data scientist that has been able to exploit from that data center by using machine learning models. And I think that's a perfect application of, again, in a very complex system, how you have to use machine intelligence, machine learning to be able to really understand and, and drive that system to a near optimal point. And if you extrapolate that, we think there are many complex systems, the, the planet being one of them, where ultimately we have the capability to apply that same level of machine learning. So there's a whole set of and class of problems that we think are extendable beyond what we're doing today. It's interesting, a lot of the discussion around DIFF, and there, there are um, many sessions around uh, AI and, and machine learning and automation, and, and this technological unemployment question comes up a lot, but um, there is this thread that you pick up on there that where these technologies can assist yes. humans in, yeah. in making leaps in, in, in performance or, or use of materials or energy that, w that we wouldn't have been able to do alone. That's right, that's right. Nick, I want to just come to you. Um, so Google are, are one of our, our global partners at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation alongside yep. companies like H&M, uh, uh, Philips, Nike. What did Google bring to the party? Well, I think um, you sort of touched on, on a big part of it, which is they're one of the world's leading brands, you said, but they're one of the world's leading organizations. And, and, and I think a lot of people 
look to them for inspiration, particularly around this question of technology and, and, and innovation. Um, so I think they, they bring with them a tremendous um, capability to, to challenge the status quo. This sort of almost this dissatisfaction with the way things are now and what, what can we do better and how can we think differently. So I think there's, there's a sort of profound alignment with the, uh, the underlying philosophy of the foundation and also the other global partners. So they bring that energy and they, they bring that sort of fuel almost to the fire. Um, beyond that, I think they have a, a real uh, um, desire to use their unique technology, uh, technological platforms to, to actually, again, going back to what Jim said, to, to make the world a better place, to, to, be, to be very simplistic about it. Um, and I think bringing that um, unique sort of experience, that Silicon Valley sort of mentality, um, the capabilities and resources of Google, bringing that to the global partner set and being very open and collaborative about the desire to work with others and to say, you know, like the other global partners, we're leading in our industry and we want to do this with other people. I think that's really powerful and I think um, that resonates with the millions and millions of users of Google's products and services around mm -hmm. the world. We'll be back with you two in a few moments uh, to talk more about innovation at Google and, ha and how that works and to take some of the questions from, from Twitter. But if you're just joining us at the DIF or if this is your first session, then you've just discovered a veritable cornucopia of innovation and creativity spanning three weeks. Here's Sarah with more details. Thanks, Joe. So if you've been inspired by this session so far, then you're going to enjoy the next one coming up at 4 p.m. and that's Oh, no, this is the wrong, this is the wrong one. But the next session is talking about the influence of disruptive technologies in Africa. So you can find that at thinkdiff.co at 4 p.m. today. So visit the website and find the session in the schedule. Then after that, I, this will be different too. So, <laughs> so we've also got a ton of sessions already in our catch up. It's only week one, but there are many sessions that if you missed, you can watch them again or for the first time in our catch up area. So be sure to go there. One of the sessions there that um, is a highlight is looking at prosperity without growth. And that's with Professor Tim Jackson. So look out for that one. And if you don't already, then you can follow the Disruptive Innovation Festival on Twitter at thinkdiff underscore. So we're putting updates on there with news uh, about the festival and sessions when they're going live. So you can find all of that information there. Um, something that we posted recently or what, um, was something that was posted by a member of the DIFF team um, is about our interactive graphics, which are now available at thinkdiff.co. So you can find them in one of the latest news items and please go there, post your comments and insights on a variety of topics. And one last thing, if you love the diff and you want to get more out of every drop, then you need to get a My Diff account. And you can find this at the login part of our website on thinkdiff.co and just go there to create your My Diff account for weekly email updates and be able to tailor sessions just for you. And it's back to you, Joe. So we've only got 15 minutes left and you better make this count. Thanks very much, Sarah. So all of those sessions can be found at thinkdiff.co, head to the schedule page, uh, and check out the catch-up pages for more. Um, sometimes things just don't go your way and can be a bit uh, unpredictable. And I think the events of the past 48 hours have shown that. Um, we do, I, we, I wonder what we're going to get to that. <laughs> we do live in, a, in an unpredictable, in unpredictable world. Jim, how does something like a, a, a change in leadership and, a, and quite a um, substantial one at yeah. that, how does that impact Google's strategy and, and outlook? I would say that, uh, first of all, we're probably all in a bit of shock right now. Uh, I, I actually was uh, in, in Dublin for the uh, US election, which I think offered a very unique and, and innovative, or sorry, interesting uh, perspective on it uh, through the eyes of a, of a different part of the world. And you know, I, I alluded to this or mentioned this earlier, I, I think we are uh, all in a bit of shock right now, uh, and, and obviously a number of us are asking how we got here. Um, it's hard, I mean, candidly, it's, it's hard to have a crystal ball and predict what the outcome of this is going to be. Uh, you know, that said, um, you know, President-elect Trump uh, has made a lot of uh, uh, prognostications and statements that have been, uh, I would say, at, at odds with 
many of us that have worked in the sustainability field for years. Uh, you know, statements about COP21 and, and uh, other things. Uh, look, you know, I think it would be very easy to go down a path that's not constructive. And, uh, I, and I sent a note to my team last night in the States and said, this is an opportunity and this presents an opportunity for companies like Google to stand up and take a leadership position. And again, I don't know what our federal government stance will be. Uh, we're, we're certainly in an administration right now that's been extremely aligned to uh, global climate change and, and sustainability. Uh, but if that's not the case in, in the future administration, or the next administration, corporate America and corporate leadership around the world uh, is going to have to stand up and, and uh, fill that void. Uh, and that's, in many ways, that, that I think really excited people. Um, you know, I, I talk to many, many people around the world, from millennials who realize they are inheriting a very fragile and volatile planet, to corporate CXOs that fully recognize that this is an integral part, you know, sustainability and, uh, you know, running responsible businesses is something that their boards, their customers uh, are asking for. The genie's out of the bottle, right? You don't shove the genie back in the bottle. No, no one person, no matter how po powerful they are, is going to change the course of history. Uh, so, you know, I, I've told my team, look, stay focused. This is an opportunity for us to demonstrate with our peer company's leadership uh, and if anything, let's use it as a rallying cry and a catalyst to do what we, we all think is the right thing and everybody's asking us to do. Uh, so uh, ironically, it, it, uh, yeah, I, I tend to be an optimist, but uh, I, I believe that, that some good will come out of this as well. And maybe just to add to that, I think the important question to ask also is, you know, what doesn't change? And, and to Jim's point, you know, doing the right thing and, and from a you know, the perspective of this conversation, you know, the, the, the rationale for a circular economy and for pursuing these sorts of ideas and, and, you know, very practical implementation in the case of Google, you know, that doesn't change. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it pertains and, and, and will continue. So I think, um, I think that, you know, Jim's point about uh, focus and, um, and seeing the opportunity and continuing to do the right thing uh, yeah. is 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 very important. Yeah, just one thing that, that sparked the thought. I, I I think that in some political circles, and this is not only uh, unique to the United States, in some political circles, this whole you know uber philanthropic uh, notion of of the circular or not uh, sorry sustainability and global climate change is something that that is debated heavily. And again, when you take it back to and put it around a framework of uh, the corporate, I mean, uh, uh, the Helmuth Garth Foundation and circular economy, it really detooths, for lack of a better word, that whole argument. Mm. Because this is perfectly aligned with what countries want to do. Improve jobs, improve the economy, improve the, you know, the economic stance of their country. So again, I would argue that you can put all that aside. This is ultimately how this problem will be solved anyway. So again, it's, it's something that's almost a moot point, I would argue. While we look at the kind of regional and national, and now I'm looking at a sort of regional uh, spotlight, what do you think the role is of Silicon Valley in, in driving this? Um, I mean, obviously California, um, uh, in terms of the, the election, voted quite heavily uh, in, in, for, uh, in, for the Democratic vote. Um, but, when we talk about when we think about circular economy and and yeah. an innovation towards a circular economy, what is the role of, of Silicon Valley, or, or 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 do you think it could be a real driving force? I think it will be a driving force. I, I've lived most of my adult life in Silicon Valley, and there are some unique traits that make Silicon Valley a special place. I've traveled all over the world, and I've seen areas of the world that are close to replicating the attributes of Silicon Valley and what make it what makes it unique, but nothing completely. And I think one of the core foundations and values of Silicon Valley is this almost youthful naivety around we can change the world against, in some cases, insurmountable odds. And I think that that's something that's indelible 
And you know, Silicon Valley's been around since the 60s, but that common thread of changing the world pervades every entrepreneur. I mean, you know, I even look at our founders, Larry and Sergey, when they founded Google, the world didn't need another search engine. In fact, people were saying, what's this all about? But these guys wanted to change the world in a very unique and different way. So again, I think we have this history of looking at these large scale global problems and saying, for us, that's something that is, it's, it's a challenge, it's an opportunity, but it's something that we, that we love to do. And, you know, so I think that that's something that, and it's something that, that, again, is part of our culture. We gravitate towards those big problems. So we look at this and go, this is something we can solve, and it has to be solved. Got some great questions coming in from Twitter and from the comment section, so do keep sending them in. But first, a question now, I mean, I've got plenty more of my own, but uh, good to hear from the, the diff audience online. Um, you mentioned that you're set up with systems in mind, that's kind of integral uh, to Google, but even at Google, this seems to be, uh, because we don't perhaps have a circular economy yet, this is still linear in its use of materials, Very energy, so. and information. So what are you doing to drive a shift in mindsets from linear to circular at scale within Google? Yeah. I mean, ultimately, we would love to see a biodegradable computer that Essentially, you know, literally, you could drop in the ground and and you know, up would come a tree. Now, I think that that's a little hypothetical, but ultimately, we believe that this has to be solved by computer science. It's no secret, and I and I wouldn't uh, run away from that at all. We're using traditional manufacturing techniques that are very energy intensive. Uh, we believe ultimately that this is a computer si or a material science problem that we are going to have to solve. We cannot do it alone. You know, although we are one of the world's largest server manufacturers, we have to partner with all of the other people that are consuming these goods and work with foundations like the Al MacArthur Foundation and you know, uh, some basic research as well. Uh, and that's something that we're going to do for the long haul. Again, building an economic framework around it that makes sense. But ultimately, we think we have to look at this as a true you know, cradle to cradle circular economy problem. And ultimately, it is, a, it is a material science problem mm -hmm. and a physics problem. Mm -hmm. I think, again, just, just to add to that, the, the history of Google and the, you know, the current culture of Google is one that is intellectually curious. Uh, and and you know, that has led to many of the, the great products and services that, that we've seen um, in recent years. And I think that intellectual curiosity coupled with this underlying sort of systems thinking that, that Jim also mentioned earlier, you know, will will drive a, um, a you know an, an inspiration. You know, will continue to provide a source of inspiration, and and will lead to a generation of material scientists, a generation of of infrastructure engineers, a generation of all the sorts of people that that are so interesting to leading organisations, whatever their industry. And and I actually think that that, that sort of opportunity, um, uh, you know, will emerge. And that we'll see, you know, some of these hypothetical ideas like um, biodegradable infrastructure, you know, becoming a reality. Um, and 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 I think that's again part of why it's so great to have um, a, an organisation like Google as a global partner is because they they really represent that and they really symbolise that, um, you know, in terms of the, the global uh, consciousness. Yeah, I think it's a generational thing too. Mm. Um, my generation tends to look at sustainability uh, as really an exogenous event where you know, it, it, it wasn't something that was ingrained in us from day one. If I look at most of the, the, of the, the millennials and, that I work with, this is something that they were profoundly aware of from a very young age. So for them, this is something that's integral to the way they think. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, those are the people that are going to drive the next phase of innovation at our company and others. So it, it's something that, that is you know, woven into the very fabric of the way they think and, and think about large-scale problems. That's really interesting because it's um, something that we hear with circular economy every now and then that, that uh, people from a, perhaps an older generation say, oh, well, we used to fix TVs and things mm -hmm. like that back in my day. So it's, it's great to hear the counterpoint to that, that yeah. the, the, the younger generations have perhaps that, that systems thinking approach. Mm -hmm. um, one of our more humorous viewers 
has added that we already had a bio biodegradable computer called an Acorn, uh, which um, yeah. as I'm sorry, that has not got zero last from our uh, audience in the studio here. Um, but uh, the chat uh, and, the, and the discussion um, on the diff site has moved on a little bit to around Google and Alphabet products. So yeah. I want to focus on that for sure. a, li a little while. Um, so uh, Ryan says, do you think any Google Alphabet products can help sh lead the shift to a circular economy? I'm actually going to add a bit more specific detail from Mariano, who says, do you see self-driving cars as part of your circular economy strategy or vision? We do, and I'll answer, I think there are two questions there. Uh, I'll answer the, the first one on autonomous vehicles. There's no question, uh, autonomous vehicles are inevitable. Uh, most of us that, that fly, if you fly anywhere today, you, you actually don't realize you're flying in an autonomous plane. The pilot barely touches the, uh, the instruments anymore. So uh, we kind of joke because most of us have been in autonomous vehicles without our fully understanding it. It's just that we put drivers into the loop 100 years ago when the car was invented and it's been hard to, do, to get us out of those, that mode. Um, yeah, I, I come from an area of the country that's probably one of the worst congested traffic areas. And the, it, it's interesting, if you look at queuing theory and the physics behind traffic jams, it's actually not solely driven by the number of cars on the road. It's actually more influenced by the way people drive. Mm. So we think that, um, and we know that looking at self-driving cars and the ability to couple those cars together intelligently solves a massive congestion problem. Now. We know that those cars drive more efficiently. We know that they choose more efficient paths than humans do. Uh, we have millions of miles of testing of autonomous vehicles. Uh, so we do feel like that's something that's certainly integral to, uh, you know, how, but it's a step in terms of how you develop a circular, circularly designed city, for example. But we do believe that that ultimately is part of that. Now, the question was, uh, how do some of the other Alphabet products um, uh, enabled circular economy. I actually think one of our most interesting pro uh, projects, products, is called Earth Engine. And Earth Engine is a spin out of uh, Google Geo. Uh, and effectively, what we've done is if you think about the planet, the, th the planet is this you know, ecosystem of instrumentation. Uh, and you know, coupling uh, imaging data and uh, uh, geographic data, l uh, machine learning, big data, all that together allows us to look at imaging of a, a certain part of the ocean, for example, and we can tell if an area is being overfished. We look at the boats, the ships on the water, we can determine a tanker from a cargo freighter to a fishing boat. We know based on ML, machine learning, the size of that boat. We know if it's got nets in the water, it's likely fishing. We know the kind of fishing. We know the average yield of that fishing. We're able to extrapolate all that data and look at a particular area of the, the, the globe and say, we believe that area is being overfished. We've done the same with Global Forest Watch. You know, so we can then, we can take that element, those elements, and we think we can do this on a planetary scale, to be able to actually monitor resources how they're being consumed, reused, et cetera, in near real time. And at that point, we think that that's an, an alphabet product that allows us to actually run the planet in a much more efficient way. That might be as a, an example of one that maybe hasn't grabbed as many headlines as, as self-driving cars, but it could be exactly. huge, hugely influential. I think it's hugely influential. In fact, I think it's, it's as influential as self-driving cars. Mm -hmm. another, another project that um, has been brought up by JP Denke on mm -hmm. Twitter uh, is uh, is Project Ara, mm -hmm. um, and uh, he or she says Project Ara was stopped. Are there key circular learnings from that project yeah. uh, that you can apply to future product design? Yeah. So, pro I mean, I think so. The project was stopped, but we're seeing a lot of the concepts of Project Ara actually augmented reality, for example, uh, make their way into other projects and products within Google, and I think you'll you'll see that continue to evolve. We think that uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, allows people to operate much, much more efficiently. Uh, and you know, again, I think you'll see elements of Aura be uh, reconstituted in future products, mm -hmm. but uh, certainly it's a great question. And I think if, if 
Yeah, just to, to jump in, if I think about the work that we are doing together um, and our mission for that, it, it is to um, integrate and embed circular economy principles into Google's infrastructure, operations, and culture. So, you know, it's, a, it's about as broad as it could be. Mm. And I think um, that is, of course, bounded by the reality of a large, ever-changing, incredibly dynamic organization like Google. So I think it, it's important to, to really seize that point and say, you know, projects and interesting learnings will, will come and go. And it, the question is, well, what do we take from them? How do we sort of use that to feed back into mm -hmm. the system yeah. to inform the next iteration, the next inspiration? And, and you know, um, personal hardware devices is a, is a great example of that, as, as Project Ara was. And, and let me pick up on that, because tech companies, um, w when it comes to uh, circular economy, do get a bit of heat sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, these, these, these upgrade cycles, and people say that's not yeah. really, uh, doesn't support a circular economy. Um, uh, lure of shiny gadgets and things like that. Nick, do you think this is a chance to tell a new, a new story, to craft a bit of a new narrative around the role that tech companies can play in the circular economy? I mean, I think um, that's an incredibly large question. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I do think it, there is an opportunity to um, influence the story that tech companies tell. Now, I think it is ultimately for tech companies themselves to decide what story you know, that is. But I think there is an opportunity to influence it. I do think, um, you know, my, my personal view on this would be that any organization you know, not just Google, many of the organizations that we, we work with across the foundation and many of the organizations that are immediately recognizable to everyone in the world, um, you know, they, they, uh, they have their sort of detractors and they have their challenges and, you know, there's a bit of a case of the good and the bad and, and that will always be the way. I, I'm tremendously inspired and, and reassured by organizations such as Google saying they want to take a leadership position on this recognizing the challenges, saying that they want to solve those challenges with others. And I think actually that's the inspirational story, really, and particularly in moments you know, that we're going through at the moment. So um, yeah, I, I think there's a, real, a very significant opportunity to tell a different sort of story. But I think it's for, and I think it should be for these organizations to determine what that story is. There's a lot of questions coming in about um, innovation at Google and how that works. Um, one, uh, one here, this is actually um, one that I, I was thinking about beforehand around, around moonshots. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, there's, there's this Google X, yes. um, which uh, a quick Google search tells me that it's uh, the moonshot factory, it is. which, is, uh, which is, 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 a, is a huge claim. Um, not all innovation can happen in great leaps. How do you manage the tension between these giant leaps forward in, in innovation compared with kind of in, incremental innovation that ha might happen more gradually? Yeah, we have a joke within Google. Uh, we have moonshots, which tend to be 10x, 100x type of improvements. Uh, and we have these, and we joke, and, and we have uh, roof shots, which are basically <laughs> continuous improvement. Mm. And to your point, they, they are both instrumental to our success. Uh, moonshots, we typically, moonshots have been created out of traditional businesses. They tend not to be. Uh, they tend to be, you know, we, hence the, the creation of Google X, Google X, where we allow people to be unencumbered by some of the traditional trappings of a large company, where they're able to go off, try new things, fail. We think that that's absolutely part of, of the, the innovation cycle. Uh, that's not something that, that I think most companies embrace. That's considered, you know, being on a failing product. Most of my corporate life cycle or uh, corporate history has not been a badge of, of, of honor or courage. Mm. At Google, you know, that's, that happens daily. Um, you know, juxtaposing it with, uh, with this whole notion of roof shots, we want to drive uh, improvement and continuous improvement because this is something that, you know, you can't take a, a data center that you've invested hundreds of millions of dollars into and, and, and change it overnight. That requires continuous improvement. So the two exist coexist, uh, I'd argue, for probably different purposes, uh, but ultimately, uh, you know, they both drive innovation in very interesting ways. And I think Google's recognized your point, it's a great question about that, that tension, that part of addressing it is, first of all, recognizing it and understanding that 
they are different ways of uh, the different ways of doing things. We, we hear, and, and I get asked a lot about um, about X and about Astro Teller and, and, and moonshots and innovation at Google, because it's it's become so it's such an inspirational sort of part of the story. But I think what's really important is to, to to dig down underneath that and understand, in the case of X, you know how have the the process that supports it, yeah. the actual process that supports moonshots. Because that's what is fascinating, and I think that's what is so difficult. It's very easy for companies to say, we want to change the world, we want to you know, drive 10x or 100x improvement, and we've got these great people, and we've got a great sort of setup, and we're going to fund it. But, but the, the art of it, and I think it's taken from the outside, it, it's taken Google you know, 10 years to get to this stage of, of, of maturity in terms of the process that drives that. And failure is a big part of it, absolutely. But there was a, 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 a fantastic um, blog post by Astro Teller recently, really explaining the different stages that go into moonshot development. Yeah, and, and I think that's so important. Yeah, and interestingly enough, there's not a lot of cross fertilization between the members of Google X mm. and the members of, of my team, for example. And I mean, by that I mean, those people are cut typically from a different cloth. And they look at the world through a different set of lenses than I do. Uh, and there's, obviously, we need both of those to coexist. Mm -hmm. But it's very interesting because, uh, to Nick's point, it's culture, it's people, it's incentives, um, with kind of this you know, almost aspirational uh, you know, intent to go and reinvent the way things are done. And it's very difficult sometimes when you're sitting in a normal business and you're trying to, you know, let's go and create the next version of, of the search algorithms. It's very difficult to get out of that framework to say, we're going to totally reinvent the way that X, Y, or Z is, is done. Mm -hmm. And I think X is, is to your point, they've, they've been honing that, that culture and that system of innovation. And I'm sure that it will continue to be uh, tweaked further. Mm -hmm. We've got just a couple of minutes left. I'm going to take one more question in from Twitter, which was um, really looking at this on the global scale. Will the next billion users in developing economies be able to take advantage of the circular economy? Can Google help them? Absolutely. We have a significant uh, set of initiatives under, underway to drive uh, you know, operations and, and products to the next billion set of users. Mm. Um, again, we think that you know, it's, it is about improving their lifestyle. It isn't about access to information. Um, but we recognize that, it's, that the way the last three billion people got online is probably not the way that the next one, two, or three billion people are going to get online. The economics are different. The, uh, even the applications of technology are different. So we're, there isn't a day that goes by that we don't spend a lot of time talking about that, but uh, absolutely. We've had loads more questions in on, uh, on Twitter and, and through the comments section. I know you've got to uh, head back to, back to the airport to, uh, to head back to the US and uh, see what the impact is over there, I guess. Um, but uh, thank you so much for joining me today, Thank Jim. you very much. Uh, thank you, Nick. Thanks, and Nick. Uh, on that note, we've come to the end of our session today. Um, thank you for all your fantastic questions throughout this conversation with Jim Miller from Google. Don't forget to click the feedback button to let us know how you found the session. And if you're looking for more diff goodness, then how about the session starting in 15 minutes? It's uh, with Systemic looking at a good disruption around a new narrative for disruptive in innovation. But for now, that's all from me, from Jim and from Nick. Thanks for joining us at the Disruptive Innovation Festival and we'll see you next time.